Gabby Resch is our Vice President of uh, Product Management. Gabby's been in the industry for uh, uh, over a, almost a couple of decades now, and he's spent at least a decade on um, product management. Uh, he came to Checkpoint from Vocal Tech, uh, a very, uh, very cool company. Uh, worked a bit at Kanga Networks, which was acquired by Juniper, and a number of other um, um, smaller startup uh, companies. So he knows the startup world, he knows the, uh, the security world. Um, really pleased to have him out here. What he's not going to do this morning is actually talk about our products, though. Um, he's actually got two breakout sessions this afternoon where he's going to be talking about the full product roadmap for those that uh, are keen on that, and also about R80. R80 being our next software release. I, I can hear the groans from some of the customers who haven't upgraded to R77 yet, but, but we're talking about R80. So uh, please welcome uh, Gabby to the stage. He's going to cover off our 2014 security report. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I wanted to talk about, again, I'm not going to talk about products necessarily. I want to talk about the 2014 security report. Um, this is the second year that Checkpoint has published a security report. I assume some of you have actually received hard copies of it. Some of you actually downloaded it from the web. And if you haven't, you're uh, welcome to do that. I want to talk about the 2014 security report for a main reason, because I think it gives you a very strong insight of all the things that we spoke about this morning. It shows you what's happening in the security landscape from a very, very, very interesting angle. If you compare to many other different surveys, this report, and it's again the second year that we're doing it, is taking, instead of asking people questions, surveying people and getting all kinds of subjective answers, we're actually gathering data. And we're gathering data from multiple different sources. So the first source of information that we're actually gathering is from uh, about 9,000 different security gateways around the world. We're actually not taking information from the gateways. We're taking attack information. Okay? We're taking only information that's relevant from an attack perspective, no data itself. But we're collecting information that we can from these gateways. Again, nothing sensitive. The second piece of information is for what we call the security checkup, and I will talk about it very, very soon, what a security checkup is, but it's our ability to sample information and actually read events and read security information within different security environments that we're in. And I will talk about it very shortly. Another source of information is we've done something very, very similar to our security checkup but with the endpoint, with our endpoint security environments, meaning that we embedded software within our customer's endpoint, with our customer's permission, within different endpoints and machines that are out there, and we're able to monitor the information there. So what we've been doing is we've actually collect, collecting security information, events that are happening within the worldwide uh, environment that we're in, 200,000 monitoring hours, 120 countries have collected information, and you can see from various industries also. So we believe that it gives us a very, very good, interesting, and a very interesting sample snapshot of what's happening from a security perspective. Why is it important? Because at the end of the day, when you go back home, you really want to analyze what will be the situation within your environment. And we think it gives you a very, very good statistical sample. It's not about who I ask and why I'm asking, but it gives you a very interesting sample of what's the real situation that we're all facing these days in the different enterprises, the different uh, regions, different types of industries. I want to zoom in for one second into the security checker, because just to give you some kind of uh, understanding what this is, just as a raise of hands, who has run a security checkup in their environment till now? OK, so we have some hands, not enough, but we have some hands that was raised. So what's a security checkup? Well, a security checkup is uh, a risk assessment process that we do free of charge for our customers. And what we do is we plug in an appliance. It could be a physical appliance. It could be a virtual machine. And we plug it in either as a mirror port or inline, but we can do it multiple ways. And what we do is we listen to the traffic. And we gather all this information. We listen to events, security events. And we collect all this information. And we generate a report through our smart event device. The main purpose of this security checkup or risk assessment is to give you the customer to give you a report that you can use and you can actually show to your managers. I think very much aligned to the previous sessions where instead of just talking about many different events and things that are happening, we can actually show you or provide you with 
justifications for many different security strategies that you want to build inside your organization because this report will give you a very strong insight of what was happening, what happened within that specific test in 24 hours, three days, how long, whatever long the test took. It'll give you a very strong insight of what's happening in your organization. So what do we look at? We look at applications and all kinds of different traffic and network usage that happen inside the organization. We look at the different applications that are your individual corporate users are using inside the organization, what different types of traffic are passing through the wires. And we also look at attacks that within this window of time that we were doing some risk assessments, we were looking at specific attacks, malicious activities that were happening on company resources. Again, it gives you a very strong insight of what's happening, a very interesting snapshot that we've seen that for my purposes, for your purposes also, it's a very, very good foundation for you to build a security strategy inside your organizations. You have this report in front of you. You can actually sit with checkpoint people, our partners and resellers with your managers and actually help together build some kind of strategy based on the insights and the results of this report. So again, this is security checkup. It's a free on-site uh, uh, risk assessment uh, uh, service that we're offering and if any one of you is interested, I'll talk about it at the end, but there are many people here with pink uh, uh, colors here that they can actually help you here. So let's go back to the security report. And what I want to do in this presentation, I want to show you some of the insights of information that we collected in 2013 that were actually the result of the 2014 security report. But before I begin, I want to start with a story. This is actually a story, a security event, a real security event that happened with a global energy company, a worldwide global energy company, about 10,000 employees. That happened sometime in April. It's not specifically related to the security report, but I will talk about it at the end why it's interesting and why it's relevant for this discussion. So what is this story all about? Well, the story starts with the US headquarters. And you know, like in many, many different organizations, I'm going to talk about uh, um, something called a water hole, a watering hole. And watering hole in the world of cyber is all about the fact that if I can gain, I can find and gain interest with some kind of a website that many people inside the organization are accessing, and I can actually, I know that they're accessing this website as a watering hole, and basically I can do something malicious to this website, I can potentially infect multiple people inside all this organization. So this example, you know, we're calling it the Delhi, the delicatessen water hole. Why are we calling it that? Because this is a very typical type of attack or set of vectors for a specific attack. The first stage of an attack, this attack was that the attackers that were trying to penetrate this energy company, what they did was, the first thing that they did was that they did reconnaissance, like any attack. Like any target attack, there's reconnaissance. And they found out that many people in this, in this organization had the same behavior. And what was the same behavior? It was uh, you know, a behavior that many organizations, many of you may be also doing the same thing. They were accessing, you know, in the morning, they were accessing a website of a local deli, a local restaurant, basically to order food for lunch. Okay, so they're all accessing the same website, or many individuals within this organization were accessing the same website. That was the first part, reconnaissance. The second part was reeling them in into this, using this information, this reconnaissance, to do something bad. So these attackers accessed this local daily's website. And you know, you heard from Inbar that there are multiple interesting and innovative ways of doing that. Again, it's not penetrating the organization. It's going to this local daily and doing something bad to their website. And you know, he showed you how to do some or to implant all kinds of malicious uh, 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 exploits into the website of the hospital. That's what Inbao showed you before. But what in this case they did, they embedded malware in a JPEG of that restaurant's website. The third step was actually bumping them on the head. Basically, this malware wants individuals inside the organization, this energy company, access this website. Well, some of them, OK, uh, were exposed as a result of this specific, or exploit as a result of that specific malware, based on a vulnerability in employees' computers. So once an employee accesses this website, and this specific explorer browser on that specific employee's website 
was vulnerable to this specific exploit. Well, this malware was now actually installed on this individual's or multiple individual's computers within um, the organization. And once this exploit is actually installed, the next thing that this specific malware was doing was actually installing a website toolkit, okay, on this specific individual's computer. So this is, a, again, a set of stages that were used in order to get into the organization from the outside. And, you know, if you do one plus one, if you know the things that Inbao told you this morning, they're quite uh, interesting ways of doing that. The last part of it was basically going for the big one or spreading wide inside organizations. Usually what happens is that I always need to find one way of penetrating inside the organization, and then I start to propagate my malware inside the organization, going, you know, using it as kind of a beachhead where I start to do all kinds of horizontal movements inside the organization. Why? Because I'm looking and searching for information. So if you read all kinds of different attacks that you've been hearing and reading about in the past previous years, this year, even the targeted attack, the target attack this year, it starts with the penetration from inside the organization, malware travels, it communicates to CNC hideouts outside the organization until it gets to a destination where things become very interesting and that's where it stops and it actually does create damage. So this is an example and what's the outcome? Well, it's interesting, this energy company, this attack, we started to hear about it in April, and suddenly after a couple of weeks where there was information about it, no, no more information. You can't find any more information about it. We Googled about this, you know, this specific story. They know more, nobody's talking about it anymore. So it's interesting, again, it's an energy company, there was infiltration inside the organization, and what were the results, we don't know. But still, you can see that it's a very interesting sta set of stages for an attack, and the reason that I'm mentioning it because this is part of a very growing trend with malware events these days, okay, where I do reconnaissance, I find ways to, with social engineering, to try and get some kind of a way to infect a machine, create a beachhead, and then from there I can actually do and propagate my malware inside the organization and create the damage that I want to create. It's happening a lot, and we see that it's impacting organizations around the world all the time. Let's go to our security report and see all different indications that we've seen in our 2014 security report. Well, I think the most important trend that we're seeing is that we see an increase of malware in organizations that we're working or we're seeing that. We're seeing more and more malware being, uh, being I wouldn't say being used, but we're seeing more of the organization exposed to malware a lot before. 84% of the organizations that we surveyed we actually saw that there are four out of five. We saw that there were traces of malware inside these organizations, traces of malware communicating from the out, inside to the outside. We saw that. We also saw that every 10 minutes in average, okay, within the security checkups that we did, there was malware downloaded in the organization. This is quite frightening, I must say, and this is a very, very alerting number. Now, you can say, why does it have to do, what does it have to do with us? But as I said at the beginning, this is a very significant sample of organizations around the world, okay? 9,000 different gateways that are representing different organizations. And if you, say, if you look at that from a statistical sample, this could be very, very much, it could be your organization the same way. It, your organization can be acting the same way. We also noticed what Anon spoke about earlier this morning, the difference between what we call unknown and known. Known is known malware, which is pieces of malware that we know of, signatures that we know of, based on different indicators that we know of. And we also are finding traces of the unknown malware. What is unknown malware? Well, it comes from multiple different sources. Zero days, meaning that malware that was not existent before. Okay, all kinds of obfuscation, meaning that the malware is hidden, it may be in JPEGs, and all kinds of ways that attackers are trying to hide the malware, the traces of malware within, the, within the specific places that they want to put the malware itself, and new variants. And with different reports, we see that mal there are about 100,000 or hundreds of thousands of pieces of new malware that are generated on a daily basis, because it's very, very simple to gen generate and create new variants of the same traces or pieces of malware. So this is what we call the unknown, meaning 
pieces of information, pieces of malware that have no traditional ways. I can't use my antivirus anymore to actually trace an attack or, or find them. So this is what Unknown is all about. We've seen that third of the organizations, 33% of the organizations that we surveyed, we saw that we saw traces of unknown malware through our sandboxing technologies and other pieces of pieces of, of, of information that we actually collected, we saw that 30, 33%, third of the organizations that we surveyed, they were downloading malware. Every 20 sec, 27 minutes, we found traces of unknown malware downloading of organizations. Again, it's representing each one of us here in this room. Going to known malware, well, the most important, I think, and the most alarming uh, situation with bots. Bots are these agents, software agents that are sitting on our machines, okay, and they're basically communicating to the outside world and doing all kinds of things based on controls that they're getting from the criminals that are sitting outside the organization. In 2012, when we surveyed the last year's survey, we talked about 60 or two-thirds of the organizations we identified bots in the organization. This year, we're actually seeing an increase. 73% of the organizations that we're actually working with or we surveyed, we actually found these bots. We actually saw that every 24 hours, another computer is infected by malware, and we see that every three minutes, in average, a bot is communicating with command and control. This means that there is a serious situation, and we need to take some strong controls to actually prevent this from happening. And when I say to take strong controls, well, antivirus is not always a situation. It's not always endpoint-based antivirus is not always the cure. You see and you talk to many organizations and you say, I've got an antivirus on my endpoints. I've got a free antivirus, whatever antivirus I've got on all of my endpoints in my organization, and I'm safe, there's no problem. Well, what we surveyed and we found out was 18%. 18% is 20, almost 20% 20 of the organizations. We saw that the computers that we surveyed, they have antiviruses with not updated uh, signatures. So even if they're using endpoint-based antiviruses, they're not updated. And that means that they're not effective at all. So antivirus is all about known signatures. And if they're not updated, it doesn't really help a lot. So to summarize the malware piece of it, where we're seeing a gr uh, growth and an increase in usage of malware, it's very much aligned with the situation that we see. We are using more and more internet. We're accessing the internet a lot. With the growth of attacks, people are a lot more vulnerable than we were, they were before. And as a result of that, we're seeing this usage of malware all the time, and we're seeing this growth of malware, which requires us to take these preventive steps, to take these different steps in order to prevent them and prevent the damage of malware. Let's talk about the second piece of the security port, and that's about the applications used inside organizations. And before I talk about what we've read or what we've seen in the report itself from an application and data security perspective, I want to give another story. This is actually related to a story that we got from a security checkup. I heard that we heard all the information, and we're not sharing exactly who the customer is, but this is a large system integrator in Europe that, again, based on the security check that we did, we found some quite alarming pieces of information. So first of all, we found out that within this quite large system integrator, 1,000 of users within this organization, we're using quite, a, some quite alarming applications, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. And the most important reason, I would like to say most obvious or most common reason people using peer-to-peer -peer is sharing stuff, sharing files. Sometimes it's sharing the late, latest video or the la latest episode of whatever they want to see. And that's usually sharing music, OK? But they were using with the corporate devices, and they were using with inside the enterprise itself, OK? They were using anonymizers, OK? And your anonymizers, they have some good things about it. It's about privacy, but they also have some very significant and problematic aspects to anonymizers. Why? Because, you know, if it's good, like a peer-to-peer, -peer, if it's good for you or have benefits, it's also good for the attackers. It's their way to get inside organizations and hide traces of what they try to do inside organizations. Okay, peer-to-peer -peer is also very problematic because it's also the ability for the attackers to actually push in information and data inside organizations without you actually having any control of doing that. 
And then we also saw many of the, these, these users actually using online storage. And it's, in this case, was Dropbox. Now, I, I, I can ask people in this room here, many of us are using Dropbox, and there are a lot of good benefits for doing, using Dropbox. It's a very good way of collaborating and sharing data. It's a great way of sharing photos and images between the different computers that I have. It's very good sharing between people in the family. But it's also very, very problematic when you're using Dropbox, all kinds of online storage. It could be iCloud, all kinds of different other mechanisms of doing that, where you're sharing information inside the corporate. Why? Because you're not only sharing it with yourself, you're sharing it with some kind of a cloud source resource that you have no control of what they're doing and how they're doing and how they're using it. So that was only one angle. The second angle that we saw, which was also quite concerning, was data loss. And what we saw is that not only are they using these different applications I just mentioned before, we also found out that they're using Hotmail and Gmail, but they were using Hotmail in this case to actually share information between different individuals or between, we found different traces of people sending Excel sheets, okay, from their corporate laptops home through Hotmail. And they're actually sharing internal information and actually even more than that credit card information in it. Okay, so I don't need, and I think we spoke about it in multiple different events, so I don't need to talk about this aspects and security concerns about that. And again, it's just one sample here. Looking at the 2014 report statistics, again, we see an increase. 75% of the, of the individual uh, corporates that we surveyed are using peer-to-peer, -peer, we're using peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, um, sharing applications in 2013. And it's something that at least organizations need to know of if they don't want to take any specific controls. We saw anonymizers, increase in usage of anonymizers. And we saw access even, almost every minute to all kinds of malicious websites. People are browsing, and they're browsing even like a, in a, period, in a, of a frequency of every minute into malicious websites. This is all about people using the regular tools that they're using and how they're using the internet in organizations today. From a data security perspective, we're seeing, unfortunately, an increase in data loss events. 88% of the organizations we surveyed, we found traces of data loss or data breaches, breaches inside these organizations. And what's concerning is that from these data breaches, 33% of them happened in financial institutions, in banks that were sending credit card information to the outside world. So we're talking about usage or how people are using the internet these days and how our employees are using these, the internet these days. And even in banks and financial institutions, healthcare, hospitals, and how are they sharing information and are they doing it in the right way or not? So, why, am I, why are we showing this, all this information? Because we need to take steps in order to prevent, or at least to know about it. So once you know about it, once you have this checkup, once you have this information, you can actually take some strategies to actually prevent this from happening. So what did we find? We found an increase in usage of malware, of high-risk applications, and data loss events. What do we do about it? Well, the first thing to do is to segment your network, and Amnon spoke about it a lot. And once you segment your, your network, you limit the scope of a breach, you limit the scope of containment, contamination of malware. So that's the third aspect of talking about. From a threat prevention perspective, we spoke about it a lot today, and that's about having multi layers of threat prevention because there's no one mechanism that will help you prevent malware today, but you need to have multiple layers of malware that will prevent both the known malware, unknown malware, the pre-infections, the post-infections, all these different types of malware, different types of attacks. Altogether, you have their multiple vectors, and you need to have multiple vectors and multiple layers to actually prevent this from happening. And usage of applications and data protection, each have application control and all kinds of mechanisms to detect which applications are being used inside the organization to create the right policies inside the organization to prevent them from actually being used. Malicious websites, you need to have mechanisms like your filtering to define which URLs are allowed to be used, not allowed to be used, data loss preventions, and so on. And last but not least, 
you need to have the strong visibility because if you haven't got good visibility of what's happening in your network, if you haven't got the visibility to see these different events, you can't take the controls and you can't manage them and you can't create the, the right policies inside the organization to actually prevent this from happening. So this is what software-defined protection is all about. And this is about the three layers that we've been talking about today that actually define these different steps of prevention. So just to summarize a very short movie uh, of what it's all about, the security report. I must tell you, it's really scary. You shouldn't watch it before you go to sleep. Um, but, but the point is that security checkup that we're offering, again, a free risk assessment tool, is a very good tool for you, as I said before, to get this assessment of what's happening in your network. And based on understanding what's happening in your network, you can really get a very good understanding of how you need to operate, how to build your security strategy. So thank you very much for your time. And um, again, if you want to go and do a risk assessment, please contact one of us and we'll be happy to engage and help you with that. Thank you very much. Thanks,